Here we're told that steam is entering a first stage turbine, shown in the figure below. This is the first stage turbine right here. And uh, we're given the pressure and temperature and the volumetric flow rate coming into the turbine. So that's all given right here. The steam exits the turbine at a given pressure and temperature and then is reheated. So this is just a heat exchanger where some energy is coming in via heat transfer. And then it exits that with a given pressure and temperature and then goes into a second stage turbine. This is connected onto the same shaft as the first stage turbine. And then leaves that turbine as a saturated vapor at a given pressure. And we're told that uh, for operation at steady state and ignoring stray heat transfer and kinetic en and potential energy effects, determine the mass flow rate of steam through here, the total power produced by the two stages of the turbine, and the rate of heat transfer to the steam flowing through the reheater. Okay, so let's first start with finding the mass flow rate. So if I look here at the inlet, I can see that I have uh, the volumetric flow rate given, and I know the mass flow rate is related to the volumetric flow rate by um, dividing through by the specific volume. <clears throat> so that gives me the mass flow rate uh, through, you know, right at, at state one. So to find the specific volume at one, since I'm given the pressure and temperature, I should be able to find the specific volume from the property tables. So given P1 is 40 bar, that's an absolute pressure. T1 is 500 degrees C. I can use the property tables for water to find what that specific volume is. And if you look that up, you'll find that this is a superheated vapor phase. And the corresponding specific volume is 0 0.08644 cubic meters per kilogram. So now we have uh, enough information. By the way, this is 90 cubic meters per minute. And so we can substitute that in, you know, this specific volume in here, do some unit conversions, and then we'll get the mass flow rate comes out to be 62,500 kilograms per hour. Remember that in the problem statement here, it wants it in kilograms per hour. So you have to be careful with the unit conversion here. Okay, so that's part A, and while we're at it talking about uh, mass flow rate, if I did a control volume around the turbine and applied conservation of mass to that control volume, I would find that the mass flow rate coming in and the mass flow rate are the same. Remember from conservation of mass, I'll just write it over here, time rate of change of mass within the control volume is equal to the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out we're assuming steady state, so this term is zero. So that means the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out. So here you'd see m.1 and m.2 would be the same. I could do the same thing for a control volume around the reheater. So m.2 and m.3 would be the same. And then the same thing for a control volume around the last turbine, so that m.3 and m.4 are the same. So the mass flow rate is the same through all of these devices. And erase those control volumes, but hopefully you can see that from conservation of mass. So I'm just going to make a note here that m.1 is equal to m.2 is equal to m.3 is equal to m.4, and I'm just going to call it all m. for convenience. Okay, moving on, we're trying to find the total power produced by the two stages of the turbine. So I want to look at both stages, both turbines. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a control volume around both turbines, like this. And I'm going to apply the first law to that because I'm trying to find power. I'm trying to find this power out, so that's a first law kind of, that's, that's related to the first law. So let's go ahead and write that out. Oops, let me fix that, w dot by. Just have to write the whole expression here. Okay, so there we go. There's the first law. First term is going to be zero because it's a steady state operation. We were told that. Second term is going to be zero because these turbines are told, uh, we're told that uh, we're to ignore stray heat transfer. These turbines are operating adiabatically. 
By the way, when it says ignore stray heat transfer, it means incidental heat transfer from the turbines. Here, of course, the heat transfer is an important part, so we, we don't want to neglect heat transfer here, but at least for the turbines, we can neglect heat transfer. The W dot by term, that's what we're trying to find, that's the power coming out. We're told we can neglect kinetic and potential energy effects, so that means these terms are zero. Essentially what we're doing there is we're saying that the kinetic and potential energy terms here, like this kinetic energy is small compared to the specific enthalpy, and that potential energy is small compared to the specific enthalpy. That's why we're neglecting them, is because they're, they're just small compared to that uh, specific enthalpy term. Okay, so then let's go ahead and uh, rearrange that equation, simplify it. So the power by, uh, done by the control volume will be the mass flow rate in. Of course, the mass flow rate's just the same everywhere. And then we take in, what we do is we account for all the incoming specific enthalpies. So there's specific enthalpy coming in at one and coming in at three. So that'll be H1 plus H3 coming in. Then we have the mass flow rate out, which is just M dot. And we have the specific enthalpies at the outlets. So the outlets are at two and four. All right, so we can just, uh, we'll, we'll just leave it like that. Okay, so that's how we find the power. And of course, the mass flow rates are the same quantity here. So to find these quantities, the, the specific enthalpies, we'll use the property tables again. So we again know P1 is 40 bar, T1 is 500 degrees C. We can use the superheated vapor table. And if you do that, you'll find that uh, H1 comes out to be 3446.0 kilojoules per kilogram. We can do P2 is 20 bar. T2 is 400 degrees C. Again, if you go to the property tables, you'll find that that's also superheated vapor. And H2 comes out to be 3248.3 kilojoules per kilogram. P3 is 20 bar. T3 is 500 degrees C. By the way, it's pretty typical when going through a heat exchanger to say that the pressure remains constant through the heat exchanger. As a first cut engineering approximation, that's that's okay. In reality, the pressure will drop across the heat exchanger because you have to push the fluid through the heat exchanger to the other side. So this pressure is tip in real life is going to be bigger than that pressure there. But as an approximation, you know, especially for thermodynamics one, assuming that the pressure remains constant across heat exchangers is just fine. So for these conditions, you'll find that that's also a superheated vapor. And H3 comes out to be, when you look at the tables, 3468.2 kilojoules per kilogram. And then the last one, we're told P4 is 0 0.6 bar, and it's a saturated vapor. So we know it's immediately saturated vapor. For this one, I'm just going to use the saturated liquid uh, vapor mixture table. And you find that H4 for the saturated vapor is 2652.9 kilojoules per kilogram. So now we have all the information we need, and we can calculate the power. And that power comes out to be 17.6 kilowatts. Okay, so a lot of property lookup uh, in the tables here. All right, so that takes care of part B. Now for part C, find the rate of heat transfer to the steam flowing through the reheater. So it's, we're focused on the reheater. So let's draw another control volume. I'll draw this one in blue. And we want to apply the first law to that control volume. The first law because we're looking for heat transfer and heat transfer shows up in the first law. So we'll apply it to the reheater there. So let's write that down here. Again, we'll write out the full equation, and then we'll simplify it. Okay, almost there. All right, so here's the first law. The first term is zero because it's steady state operation. The second term is what we're trying to find. We're trying to find the heat transfer, so we'll leave that one in there. The power term is zero because uh, 
heat exchangers are what we call passive devices. There, there are no moving parts. There's no electricity, so no rotating shaft, no springs, um, you know, nothing, nothing like that. So it's we call that passive. So there's no power being done by the control volume. Again, we're saying that the kinetic and potential energy terms are negligible compared to the specific enthalpy terms. So then, when you simplify that equation, you're going to get the heat transfer in, or yeah, the heat transfer into the, or the rate of heat transfer into the control volume will be the mass flow rate. Remember, the mass flow rate in and the mass flow rate out are the same. It'll be H3 minus H2. So I'm going to bring this term over to the left-hand side. The coming out, that's state 3. So that's state 3. So that'll be H3, and then coming in is state 2. So there's your H2. I'm bringing that to the left-hand side as well. And we know all the values here on the right-hand side. We just found those a moment ago. So you can find that the heat transfer going into the reheater comes out to be 3... 0.82 kilowatts. Okay, so that's all we were asked to find in this problem, but I'm going to go a little bit further. Let's go ahead and sketch out a PV plot for this whole uh, set of processes. So here is our vapor dome, and uh, we're told that P1 is 40 bar. We know that we're dealing with a superheated vapor, so we're somewhere out there. We know uh, state 2 and state 3 are at 20 bar, so I'll put those down here. And then state 4 was at 0.6 bar. It was also a saturated vapor, so I know I'm right there. That's, that's going to be state 4. Um, the isotherm for state 1, uh, we were told that that was at uh, uh, 500 degrees C. So let me just kind of sketch an isotherm there. So here is 500 degrees C isotherm and uh, state 1 would be right there because it's at 40, 40 bar and 500 degrees C so there's state 1 state 2 is at 20 bar and 400 degrees C so that's going to be at a, a smaller isotherm I'll just draw it like that so there's state 2 this is at 400 degrees C so and then state 3 is at 20 bar and 500 degrees C. So that one's going to be right there. And actually, I've, let me um, let me change the way this looks. It's it's not in proportion at the moment. Remember, this is just a sketch, so it's not I'm not doing a very good job of sketching it. So state three is right there. I wanted state three to be to the left of state four because I know that. Um, State 4 being a saturated vapor, it'll have a very large um, and, and such low pressure. I know that the specific volume is pretty large there. So then if I sketch out the paths, we go from 1 to 2. 2 to 3 is horizontally there, and 3 to 4 looks like that. So that's, that's a, a very, very rough sketch of the process path, process paths in a PV plot. And just to since it's kind of rough here, just to clarify, if you look at the specific volumes, state 1 has the smallest specific volume, state 2 has the next smallest, state 3 has the next smallest, and then the largest specific volume is state 4. So it kind of comes down here, horizontal, since the pressure stays constant from 2 to 3, and then goes down into the right to state 4, where it intersects the saturated vapor line. Again, it's, it's not a very great diagram because it's just sketched. Okay, that covers everything in this example, so we'll end it there.